Two men will be working together in the fields, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks, one will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind, the sun has come, you've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there, she hears a noise and turns her head. Standing still, I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. Two, you're either with the Lord Jesus Christ or you're against him. If you're against him, everything's going to happen. It's all going to happen. You're going to worship the beast. You're going to take the mark of the beast. For me, you're not going to be taking the mark of the beast if you're not worshipping the beast, right? To me, they go absolutely hand in hand. And we come back into Revelation 14, and we're reading that if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, I'm being led to think because you're worshipping the beast and if you're worshipping the beast, that means your name's not written in the book of life. So I'm being led to think that these are absolutely worshipping the beast and if you worship the beast, your name is not written in the book of life and worshipping the beast will undoubtedly lead to you taking the mark of the beast. So if you take the mark of the beast, you're worshipping the beast your name's not written in the book of life. And if your name is not written in the book of life, you're going to be worshipping the beast and his image, and you're going to be receiving his mark in your forehead or in your right hand. There's no exceptions. You're all in. You're all in. So he that is with me is against me. So if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to drink the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture, and you're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So for me, it's either, it's either you, if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to be tormented, I'm being led to think, in the lake of fire forever, and if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to paradise. There's no in between. And I'm being led to think the only ones, the only ones who will not take the mark of the beast are those that endure to the end. And the only ones that are going to endure to the end are the lambs among wolves, which is where we are today. And those that are actually walking in the gospel, the gospel that this angel is holding the everlasting gospel that they 
that have endured to the end shall preach, which I'm being led to think is the body of Christ. So we've got that. It's the division, right? There's a definite division. You're either you're either with the Lord Jesus Christ or you're against the Lord Jesus Christ. And for me, it all pertains to who the, the mark of the beast for me is it's only it's only happening to those who are at the end. The mark of the beast, those that have perished before us, they they've already died. So I'm being led to think that potentially they're not subject to the mark of the beast. But we, today, everybody that's alive at the time are because it could well happen in their lifetime. And the way things are going right now, I'm being led to think that the mark of the beast could well, very well be playing out. So if you take it, you're in the lake of fire forever. If you don't take it, you're with the Lord Jesus Christ you're with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. So now I come back into the question. In Revelation 14, we've got this 144,000. So the 144,000 would be lambs in the midst of wolves. They would be saints. They would be a part of the Hebrews, I would have thought. So... The other way around, are there any Hebrews? Hebrews 12 I'm referring to. Are there any saints? Are there any members of the church? Are there any who endured to the end that are not? That are not a part of the 144,000? 144,000, I'm being led to think, are the army. They're the army of God that I'm seeing a few times in the scriptures. Back in Deuteronomy 33, so who's, who is Moses talking to, right? Because this is the blessing. This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So this is telling me that Moses, again, is prophesizing because he's talking about the blessing. So if you do walk with the Lord in his law, then you're going to be blessed. So he's talking about the blessing wherewith the Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up. And this is where it's pivotal that I, I, the scriptures are telling me that this is, this is a prophecy because he's talking about the blessing. This for me is not pertaining to the children of Israel coming up out of the land of Egypt because I'm not being led to think that all of those were saints, because they murmured right through, and the, the Old Testament Israel had to be pretty much dissolved, and most, or most potentially most, of the of the branches of the olive tree being cut off, and the and the Gentiles being grafted in. So it's a prophecy. I'm being led to think, and he said, "The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints." Now, this gets very interesting indeed. I'm going to get back to this. I just want to stay on track just for just for now. But this this word, the ten thousands, right? And how it ties into into Jude and the and the Hebrews and potentially the hundred and forty four thousand as to what these numbers, the the actual Greek and Hebrew words mean. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. So the law the law was ordained by angels as well. That's we read that in in Acts for memory, and back in back in Galatians three, we're we're reading that the gospel was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, and remembering in Revelation, we're reading that this angel has the has the gospel in his hand. So he loved the people, and all his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down. At thy feet, everyone shall receive thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. So in John, in John, it's 844 for memory. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I know, I know you're of Abraham, but your father's the devil, right? They're not saints. 
but they're a part of Old Testament Israel. So I'm being led to think that this is absolutely, this is absolutely a prophecy, and the ten thousands of the saints are the Lord's army. Now in Psalm 110, this is pretty much as cut and dry, open and closed, that this is a prophecy to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely no doubt. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. So this is fascinating as well, because the Lord Jesus Christ is the rod of the Lord God's strength, and he's going to come out of Zion the heavenly Jerusalem, and that's where the Hebrews have gone, to, to, to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, into the innumerable company of angels, and to Jesus, right? And that's where the, the 144,000 are. The 144,000 are standing upon Mount Zion, and they're with the Lamb, right? So the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, is coming out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, right? H H H two four two eight, which is army, same Hebrew word as Nebuchadnezzar's army, right? The day of the Lord's power. I'm being led to think that this is absolutely the Lord's anger, and potentially the ten thousands of saints, the Lord's army that we're reading in Deuteronomy thirty three. So the people shall be willing, the Lord's army. The soldiers of Christ in the day, the church in the day of the Lord's power, right? Those who endure to the end shall be saved in the beauties of holiness from the womb. I'm being led to think we're looking at Sarah's pleasure, right? The seed of Isaac, the true Israel, the church, right? So I'm being led to think here we're getting a manifestation of the Lord's army. We read it in Timothy soldiers soldiers of the lord jesus christ and that's who moses is prophesizing about here in deuteronomy 33. now jude gives us a little bit of a twist in that after we read about the wandering stars we read that enoch the seventh from adam prophesied of these right so he's prophesied enoch has prophesied about the wandering stars the trees whose fruit wither. So I'm being led to think potentially the Pharisees, the untimely figs in Revelation 6.13, the wandering stars, right? The wandering stars, the angels that kept not their first estate, the certain men such as the men of Korah in the game saying of Korah in Numbers 16 and 17 because the earth swallowed them up and now they're in the blackness of darkness forever they are now wandering stars. Cain, he went out to the land of Nod, which means wandering. He was a fugitive and a vagabond. And both of those words pertain to wandering, right? So I'm being led to think that Cain was a wandering star. Balaam become a wandering star. The men of Korah in the gain saying of Kor, they were wandering stars. They were these certain men, the angels that kept not their first estate. They are wandering stars, and Enoch prophesied about them, saying, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Right? So I'm being absolutely led to think that this potentially are the same saints that Moses is talking about, but in Jude we're reading that Enoch, Enoch prophesied of these wanderers, right? And as he prophesied of these wanderers, he said, well, the Lord, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints, which I'm being led to think Moses also prophesied about, and they are the people that shall be willing in the day of the Lord's power, his beauties, Sarah's pleasure, the Lord's delicates that we read about in Jeremiah 51, his beauties, they shall be willing in the day of power, the Lord Jesus Christ's army, the soldiers of Christ. And it's not an aggressive thing. We are soldiers for the truth in the gospel of peace and love. So back in Jude, we're reading that the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, this is what I was saying. I'm going to get back to this because the words become very interesting. But this is the same Greek word to innumerable. 
company of angels, right? So in Hebrews, we're getting an innumerable. So innumerable means you can't number them, that you can't put a number on it, but it's the same, it's the same Greek word as ten thousands of his saints, right? Ten thousands of his saints, that puts a number on it. That puts a number on it, and that that Greek word, it takes us back, it actually offers us. Deuteronomy 33. But as I say, I'm going to I'm going to come back and have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So back in Revelation 14, I'm being absolutely led to think that the 144,000 are the army of God, which Moses was prophesizing here about in Deuteronomy 33, that Enoch prophesized about as well. And now they are standing with the Lamb in the day of the Lord's power. The soldiers of Christ who have been redeemed from the earth, they've been redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So here I'm being absolutely led to think that we've got the 144,000. They are the Lord's army in the day of the Lord's power standing with the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Zion after being redeemed from the earth, clothed in white raiment. But they sung a new song. They sung a new song, right? Before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So the only ones, the only ones who are going to be able to sing this song are the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth. No one else. So are we going to have entities in the kingdom who can sing a song and other entities that can't? That's the question right now, right? So we come back into Revelation 15 and we're reading about the song of Moses again, right? And I saw another sign in heaven. So is this song, is this the song that the 144,000 are singing? Because the 144,000, they're singing a song as it were a new song before the throne, right? So I read this word new and we're into time again, right? So when was it new? When was it new? Because time, right? There's something about time in those scriptures. But they're singing as it were a new song before the throne and before the beast and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So nobody apart from the 144,000 can sing that song. But in Revelation 15, we're reading about them who had gotten victory over the mark of the beast and his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass. They've got the harps, right? They've got the harps of God and they sing the song of Moses. Now, I'm seeing in the scriptures that Moses, he sung two songs. He sung the song in Exodus 15, the song of victory, when the children of Israel went forth out of the land of Egypt, when the Lord God delivered them. And also he sung the song the Lord instructed him to sing to be a witness against the children of Israel. And, and Moses also wrote Psalms. And just going on memory, the word psalm actually pertains to a song. A psalm is a song. Moses wrote psalms and he sung two songs. He was sent, angels were sent, and he was a prophet. And H4397 pertains to prophets as well, right? And they're singing this song with the harps of God. So is this song of Moses the same as the song of the Lamb? 
And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are their ways, thou King, right? The King of the Saints. So I'm being led to think that this is telling us that all of those who got the mark, victory over the mark of the beast, they're all saints. Because that's the song they're singing. Thou king of the saints, king of us. King of us saints, us who have gotten victory over the mark of the beast. So is the song of Moses the song of the Lamb, the song of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is this the same song? They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So, so I'm being led to think it's the same song because we're talking about the same lyrics. We're talking about the same lyrics. So this is both the song of Moses and it's the song of the Lamb. That's what I'm being led to think. It, it might be two different songs, but just the way it's written and also that the lyrics are the same is telling me that we're looking at we're looking at the one song. So we've got entities, I'm being led to think saints who because they're, they're singing the king of the saints, the, their king, the lamb, the king of the saints, the king of them that have gotten victory over the mark of the beast. They're singing the song of Moses and we've got the 144,000. Well, they're singing this new song and nobody else, nobody else could sing that song. Now, they were, they were redeemed they were redeemed from the earth, right? So we come back into Hebrews 12 and in verse 23, and we get these similarities. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So in Revelation 14, these are redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and the Lamb. So they're not defiled with women, which ties back in, of course, to Matthew 22. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Right? For, so for those in the resurrection. So those of, of the resurrection, are they singing the song of the 144,000? Are they singing the song of Moses? Are they singing the song of the Lamb? But they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In Hebrews 12, we're reading that they've come into Mount Zion into an innumerable company. This word company, I still want to get back to that as well. But they've come in to an innumerable company of angels because I'm being led to think they're of the resurrection. They neither marry nor are given in marriage but they are as the angels of God in heaven and they've come in to an innumerable company of angels. And in Revelation 14, we're reading that these are not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb with so whether he goeth. Now I'm being led to think that everybody in the church, in the resurrection, all the saints, everybody does that. Everybody that's with the Lord Jesus Christ that hasn't taken the mark of the beast, who is not going to the lake of fire, they follow. They follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. So you're either with the Lord Jesus Christ or you're against the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no in between. And if you are with the Lord Jesus Christ, you follow him. You follow him wherever you go. So I'm seeing that the church, the saints, the 144,000, the Hebrews, all of them, people that get the victory over the mark of the beast, they all they all fit in to this category. They all fit into this category, right? Now, we, we read here in verse 4, these are they which follow the lamb with a soever he goeth. Now, I read that and I'm 50-50 with it because this, this could just pertain 
to the 144,000. The, the 144,000, these are they. They follow the lamb whether it, where, where, wherever he goes. But it could also pertain to, this is all. Nobody else. Nobody else follows the lamb. This is them here. These are they which follow the lamb. Now, as I've been putting down, you're either with him or you're against him. And that's completely up to him. I'm being led to think. But we also, what we do, it plays a role in this. Don't be high-minded because you'll be cut off as well. We need to continue. And it's not easy. It's not easy some days. It's certainly, I wouldn't call it easy here right now in the New South Wales Central Coast. But it's an honour and it's a privilege and it's very, very rewarding indeed. And Simon Peter said to the Lord Jesus Christ, when many disciples were offended and they turned their back, he, the Lord Jesus Christ said, well, you're going to, you're going to turn your back to and get offended. And Simon Peter said, well, where, where are we going to go? Where, where are we going to go, right? And that's exactly how I feel now. Like I'm not following the Lord Jesus Christ now because there's nowhere else to go. I'm doing it because I know there's nowhere else to go and nor do I want there to be. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And there, there's, no, there's no life outside of him. There's no life outside of him. So here in Revelation 14, what I'm sort of testing now, because I feel I've been led back to these chapters in Revelation now, as I say, due to both my testimony and just just questions I've asked my whole life about why we're here, etc. And, and also it's just where the scriptures have led me. It's where the videos led me and it's where the scriptures have led me. Now, my testimony, it's just worsening here. So it's now the it's now July 26 at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon here on the New South Wales Central Coast. And about an hour ago, I finished my, the, the, the giants that run the world, their obsession with the demon juice, right? I just finished that video now. So we'll wait and see how it settles and see whether the backup, the backup page gets struck as well. We'll, we'll. we'll just wait and see, right? But I'm glad I put that video down. But while I've been, been doing that video, I've been giving this a lot of thought and I've taken I've taken it to prayer as well. And this is one of these moments in these videos where I could go in, a, in quite a few different directions here. Not, not least of all the songs of Moses and the song of the Lamb that we're reading in Revelation 15. Is there a difference? What are they? And also, I most certainly want to look at this word innumerable company because I've just seen something else as well this morning in Acts. So as I put down this part of this video, I'm up to the last chapter of Acts. It's Acts 28. I'm up to Acts 28. And I just read something that, that ties into it again. And just time. Just just how there's something, there's something in those scriptures about time. And I just I just keep coming back to it. And this next part of the video, if it goes if it goes according to the plan, you'll you'll see what, what I mean in terms of I'm just coming into it again. So I'm testing this now because I feel it's very, very relevant today. I see a lot of deception around the mark of the beast and the 144,000. And, and that's, we, we, we just take that as normal now, right? Everything, everything in the Bible, everything about the very nature of our reality. It's all deception. Everyone's lying. It's, we're, we're, we're long past that, right? We're long past that. So I see a lot of deception in this area. And I feel now... I've most certainly been led here because, as I say, of my testimony and also the video. So I really, really, I just want to spend a bit more time on this now because a few things, a few things are really starting to come in here hard now because what I want to test is, okay, so let's say, let's say that we are in the end times and we are, we are going to see the end of all these things. Now, there's a scripture in Matthew. I'll go there now. And it comes in Matthew 16. Now, in verse 15, the Lord Jesus Christ asked them, Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter declares, Thou art the, thou art the Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells Simon Peter, Blessed art thou, because it's been revealed to you by, by the Lord God, his Father in heaven. Right? So it's a, it's a heavenly gift. And he tells Simon Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, shall not prevail 
against it. So I'm being led to think that, that that this rock is absolutely the Lord Jesus Christ. That the ch that the church is not going to be built upon Simon Peter. It's going to be built upon this rock that has just been declared to Simon Peter. Thou art the Christ. So it's that rock. It's the potentially to the the rock of faith. The rock of faith because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of faith. And I will give unto thee the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So I find that absolutely fascinating because I'm being led to think that everybody within the church who has who's, who's part of the resurrection, the redemption, who part of the, 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 the wedding raiment in, in white raiment, etc., I'm being led to think they all, we all, will be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But I read that thou shalt, what shall thou shalt bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. I just find that, I find that absolutely fascinating because this is telling me that there's a relationship between the earth and the heaven and what happens on the earth has a result of what happens in the heaven, potentially. So is that happening to us now? What we do right here on the earth, is that playing some sort of role in the, like are we fighting the heavenly fight because of what we do here on the, on the earth? It's fascinating stuff. But in verse 21 the lord jesus christ starts to tell them that he's going to be that he's going to be offered up to the gentiles and he's going to be killed now simon peter rebukes him and the lord jesus christ says says to him get behind me satan because thou savest not the things of god but those things be of men now this is just after he's simon peter's got this gift from heaven right and now satan Satan has, has he entered? Has he entered into Simon Peter here, right? Now in verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he, could, if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Now, here it is, right? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, right? So this for me is now talking about Matthew, Matthew 24. And this is talking about a future event. But we're back into time, right? We're back into time. But this for me is, I'm not being led to think that this is pertaining to the resurrection or the ascension because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he he shall reward every man according to his works right so I'm being led to think that this is a future event the what they call the second coming the second coming of Christ and I'm, I'm seeing that his first incarnation he was a man of sorrows but in, in the second coming, he's going to come, he's going to be glorious, right? So he was a man of sorrows. He took on everybody's sin and he, he died on the cross for everybody's sin. He was a lowly man, a man of sorrows, right? But when he comes back, he's going to come back as a glorious Messiah, a glorious ruler over the kingdom. So I see that again here. So I'm being led to think we're looking at a, at a future event, right? Now, verse 28 is always, it's all, I've gone to share it on videos a few times, but I've always, I've always backed out, right? Because it's one that does, it has quite an impact on me, right? And I, it continues to, it continues to. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So, I, I, this is time, right? So the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to a collective of people while he's alive on the earth. So this is before. This is before the, the crucifixion. 
before the resurrection, before the ascension, before any of it, right? So he's standing there in front of these people and he's telling them, you are not going to see death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, I'm being led to think he's absolutely talking about verse 27 as it ties into Matthew 24. So who are they? Because they'd all be dead, wouldn't they? Time. There's something in these scriptures about time. We come back to Deuteronomy 30. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So the Lord has driven them out into all these nations. And shall return unto the Lord thy God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Now for me, this is not a work. This for me is an outcome of faith. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This for me is talking about the, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, is, this, this can only be achieved by having the testimony of Jesus Christ. Keeping the laws of God, you can only have by keeping the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman and the saints. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations, right? Whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. And if any of thine be driven out unto the utmost parts of the heaven, from thence, so heaven, not earth, right? From thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, right? So I read this, and I'm being led to think that we're talking about, for me, the scriptures are getting very, very compelling indeed for me, that we're talking about, this is talking about the church, this is talking about faith by grace, the outcome of our faith. That's who Moses is talking to here. But this is what I say. There's something going on about time because who's he talking to? He's talking to a collective of people. I'm being led to think that are in front of him. But he's talking about events that are going to happen far, far after, far after they're dead. In fact, I'm being led to think that this is pertaining to what we're reading in Matthew 16 and 24, which I'll get to in just a sec. But the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, right? Now, in Jeremiah 32, we read some very interesting scriptures indeed. From verse 37, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in my anger and my fury, right? So the Lord is going to gather them out of all the countries, whither I have driven them in my anger and my fury. So we come back to Deuteronomy 30, and that's what I'm being led to think we're talking about here. This is, this is the same prophecy that Moses was talking about because he, he, they've been scattered among all the nations, They've been driven, they've been scattered, right, among all these nations. But Moses is talking about the utmost parts of the heaven. But then the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, which is faith by grace, the seed of the woman, the saints, who have the testimony of Jesus. Thus, they keep the two great commands. Love the Lord thy God with everything you've got and love thy neighbour as thyself, thus you fulfill the law, right? So for me, they're talking about the same, they're talking about the same people, Jeremiah and Moses. And Moses says, the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. So we come back into Jeremiah, behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in my anger and my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again, right? That's for me, that's a massive word. That word again. I will bring them again unto this place. So that's leading me to think that the body, the, 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 this is the kingdom of heaven. This is the outcome of faith that Moses is talking about here. 
because this for me, as I say, it's getting very, it's, it's time, right? There's something about time. But Moses here is talking to, I'm being led to think, getting very compelling indeed. He's talking to the church. But we're talking about celestial bodies, right? But the church is that there's people in heaven and in Revelation 12, they've overcome, they've overcome Satan and his angels as well by the power of the Lamb, right? So I'm, 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 the church for me is absolutely, it, it's pertaining to, that's why the Hebrews are going into the innumerable company of angels, because that's where the church goes. They goes to the, the church is the heavenly kingdom. It's the heavenly kingdom, right? So Moses is saying, the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And for me here, Jeremiah, he is undoubtedly, he is talking He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the church because we read, I will put fear in their hearts and I will give them one heart that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. So this is a prophecy to the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? And Jeremiah says, I will bring them again into this place, again, 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 right? So the church is going to the same place that Israel in, the land of Canaan, and Hebrews tells us the land of Canaan is the rest of the Lord Jesus Christ. They shall not enter into my rest because they didn't have faith. He's talking about, the scriptures in Hebrews is talking about the temptation in Numbers 13 and 14. And they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. So it's undoubtedly, this is undoubtedly the church, the everlasting covenant, the New Testament, grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Thus, 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 because we've got the testimony of Jesus Christ. We get this, faith by grace, the everlasting covenant right and jeremiah is saying jeremiah is saying that i will bring them again into this place and moses is saying the lord thy god will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed right so for me we're talking about the same thing and jeremiah is undoubtedly undoubtedly talking about the everlasting covenant because it says it he's talking about the church, the saints, the Hebrews, 144,000, those who get victory over the master, mark of the beast. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That's it. There's nothing outside of the church, right? So that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, I'm being led to think that for me, it's pretty in my face that that's what we're talking about. And that this place, this place is exactly what Moses is referring to here that I will bring thee into the land which thy fathers, which thy fathers possessed, right? So who is Moses talking to? So in Jeremiah, we get in verse 41, ye, I will rejoice over them to do good, and I will plant them, plant them, plant them, right? Now, this ties back to Exodus 15 that I'm going to get back to in just a bit because I am at fever pitch that Exodus 15 could well be talking about the true tabernacle that the Lord pitched and not Man, because in Exodus 15, the Lord plants them in the place of his inheritance. As I say, I'll get back to that in just a sec. Assuredly, with my whole heart and with my whole soul, right? So this for me is undoubtedly talking about the church, the everlasting covenant, and they're going to come again into this place. So that's where they were in the Old Testament, the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom, the kingdom of God. So that's what Moses is talking about, the utmost parts of the heaven, but then I will bring thee into the land which thy fathers, which thy fathers possessed. But here in Deuteronomy 30, it, we get an absolute mirror to Nehemiah 1, as I've put down in previous videos. Because Nehemiah, he beseeches the Lord in this prayer, and he says, which thou commanded thy servant Moses. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept, kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Right? So Nehemiah's talking. 
He's talking about Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. That's what we're getting in Deuteronomy 30. The Lord thy God hath scattered thee. Gather from the nations, all the nations where you've been scattered, and then I will bring you back into the land that your fathers possessed. And that's what Jeremiah is talking about here. I will gather them out of all the countries. I have driven them. And then, and then we're going to come again into this place. And this for me is undoubtedly talking about the church. I will plant them in this land. So for me, the three chapters are absolutely, they're absolutely talking to each other. So back in Nehemiah 1, if you will turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were driven of you out into the utmost parts of the heaven, right? I will gather them from thence and I will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there, right? So that's, that's Jerusalem. So if you are cast out into the utmost parts of the heaven, I will gather you from thence. Moses says that very thing. If thou be driven out into the utmost parts of the heaven, the Lord thy God will gather thee and will bring you again into the land that your fathers possessed. And that's the same land that Jeremiah is talking about. And I will bring them again into this place, into the everlasting covenant, and I will plant them, right? I will plant them in this land. So this for me is the same land. We've absolutely got the same land. That's where the church, that's going to be the land of the church, the kingdom of heaven, right? And Deuteronomy 30, for me, is an absolute prophecy to Nehemiah. If thou be driven out into the utmost parts of the heaven, thence the Lord thy God will gather thee. And that's what Nehemiah is saying. He's, he's recalling, he's recalling the prophecy of Moses. And he says, if there are any of you cast out into the utmost parts of the heaven, yet I will gather them from thence and bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and thy strong hand. Now I'm not being led to think that this pertains to some earthly man-made temple here. This this is absolutely, this is absolutely speaking to Deuteronomy 30 and Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, it's undoubtedly talking about the everlasting covenant. And it's the same land. So then we come back into Matthew 24, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, right? A celestial instrument. And they shall gather the singers. So that potentially pertains to the songs that we're reading about in, in Revelation with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. The four winds. Whoa, look at that. From one end of heaven to the other. Now, this for me just absolutely reminds me of Nehemiah 1. And remembering Nehemiah 1, for me speaking to the same entities that Moses was talking to here in Deuteronomy 30, that Jeremiah was prophesying about, in the book of Jeremiah. Now, this is quite interesting here in verse 5. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, right? And thou shall possess it. So is this saying that these entities that Moses is talking about here have never had that land? Because they've been scattered. They've been scattered from somewhere. But we're reading the Lord's going to fetch them and then he's going to bring them into the land which their fathers which their fathers possessed. And we get it again in Jeremiah 7 and verse 7. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. And Jeremiah 7 of course is the scriptures that I'm absolutely being led to think we're getting a manifestation of celestial bodies being cast out and I will cast you out if you don't if you don't do what I'm commanding you to do here I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren even the whole seed of Ephraim so how are the seed of Ephraim cast out 
we read that in Isaiah 28, where the seed of Ephraim, I'm being led to think the whole seed of Ephraim were cast down, were cast down to the earth. Woe to the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is as a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest, right? So I'm being led to think that this is absolutely pertaining to the fury of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mighty wind of the fig tree in Revelation 6, 13. This tempest is the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 11, going into the temple and casting them out, right? Casting them out. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, the Lord Jesus Christ, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand, right? So for me, this is the, this is the mighty wind casting the untimely figs, the untimely figs to the earth the whole seed of Ephraim, they're being cast. They're being cast down to the earth because for me, they're absolutely celestial bodies. And that's what we're getting here in Jeremiah 7. I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your breath from the whole seed of Ephraim, right? Because we're looking at celestial bodies. We're looking at, we're looking at the kingdom of heaven here. And in verse 7, then I will cause you, if you... If you judge, right? So the commandments back in Leviticus Leviticus 19, the tale bearer scriptures, and these are companion scriptures too for me, of Psalms 82, if you oppress not the stranger. How long are you going to oppress them for? That's what we read in Psalm 82, to the congregation of the mighty, the Lord's judges, the Lord's Elohim gods, the Lord's congregation of H430 Elohim judges. Now, it's hard to ascertain here whether they're actually in, whether they're in the house, because I read this house here and I'm being absolutely led to think the house is the land and I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. And that land is the Lord's house. And proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. So that tells me that they that they were there, that they were there. So in verse 7, we're reading this again. Then you can dwell in the land, in the Lord's house, that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. But they need... They need to thoroughly amend their ways and their doings by executing judgment between a man and his neighbour, right? And that's what we get in the Talbera scriptures in Leviticus 19. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells the scribes, the chief priests and the Pharisees in Matthew 23 that they've admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy and faith. And in Matthew 21, we read that the Lord that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take the kingdom out of their out of their hand. And the, the scribes, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they perceived that he was he was talking to them. And in verse 10 and 11, I'm being led to think this is a prophecy of Mark 11 when the Lord Jesus Christ overthrows the tables in the temple, right? And he refers to my house. I'm being led to think the land that we're reading in Jeremiah 7. And either side, either side of those scriptures, we read of this condemned fig tree. I'm being led to think the condemned fig tree are the scribes and the chief priests. They sought to kill him. And we see the fig tree dried up from the roots, right? As it casts off its untimely figs, the scribes and the chief priests, because they're having the kingdom rend away from them. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he cast them out, right? He cast them out just as I have cast out the whole seed of Ephraim. And he says, is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations, the house of prayer, but ye have made it the den of thieves. And that for me is what we're getting here in Jeremiah 7. So for me, Jeremiah here 
is speaking directly to the same entities that the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to here as he fulfills this prophecy. So it's time again, right? We're back, we're back into time. But in verse 17 we read, And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? And for me, where we see that written is in Isaiah 56 and verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain. This for me is the church again. This is the everlasting covenant that we're, we're reading in Jeremiah 32. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, into the innumerable company of angels, the spirits of just men made perfect, and made them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house. Now, that's this is interesting. This is interesting because in Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the final, he was the final sacrifice by the which we were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So this is very interesting indeed. Another scripture I want to get back to that I've just read in Acts about expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. So this tells me that there's a day where the Lord Jesus Christ won't be sitting at the right hand of God, potentially, because this is saying that he's going to do that until his enemies are made his footstool. 1 Corinthians 15, a piece of scripture that has always, always caught my attention, not least of all, that we read about the glory of the celestial bodies and the terrestrial bodies. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. But this one here, but God have given it a body as it has pleased him and to every seed, his own body. Every seed, right? Now, it's in Proverbs for memory, it might be Ecclesiastes, where Solomon tells us that the spirits, the spirits are given by God and they return to God on death. And I just wonder whether a seed potentially is a person's is a person's spirit. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. There is a, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. I could go on and on about 1 Corinthians 15. It is just the most incredible, most incredible piece of scripture. But in verse 25, we read that he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, his footstool, right? But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be in all. Now, isn't that absolutely fascinating? I, I just find that, I find that so intriguing. And Paul, he actually gives us, it, it's almost it's almost like a rundown of history here as I as I go on on. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ not be raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. So the, the resurrection is the cornerstone of everyone's faith. That's fair income. Then they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So does that mean dead or spiritually asleep? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men 
most miserable. So that's certainly spot on some days. Fates is most certainly formed in the in the valleys, not the not the not the mountaintops. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So this for me is interesting as well, because in Hebrews 12, we're reading that the Hebrews are coming to the church of the firstborn, the first fruits of them that slept, right? The cornerstone, the first. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So as I go on and on, this seems to be essential to grace. For as much as we're all cursed to be born in a world of death and sin, the, 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 the blessing of grace is just even more vast. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, right? Then cometh the end. So verse 23 again. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming, right? So is this pertaining to Matthew 16? Some will not see death until they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. Are these those that are standing at the end who have gotten victory over the mark of the beast? Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So that for me is saying that everybody, absolutely everybody, before, the, before anybody's redeemed, is an enemy. Because everybody, everybody is going to be put down. And when that happens, that means all of his enemies have been made his footstool. All of his enemies are under his feet and he must reign until that time. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So the Lord Jesus Christ has defeated death, but we still die, right? We all still die. Well, the, the entities I'm being led to think in Matthew 16 won't. But everybody dies, so he hasn't been destroyed yet, right? Even though he has, he has defeated. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the exception to the rule, right? But when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son himself be subject unto him that put th put all things under him, that God be made, God may be it all. So it's just fascinating. It's just absolutely fascinating. So this for me goes away to explain what we're getting here in Hebrews 10, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Until, right? So until everything, everything is subjected to him and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And we see on the world today, it's quite obvious here in the New South Wales Central Coast right now, that this has not happened yet, that this has not happened. It's about the, just about the redemption, back to the, just back to the state of, of mankind when they were created, something's come in in Acts, but there's many different things I want to talk about right now. So I will get there, I pray. But here we're absolutely reading in Hebrews that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the final, he was the final sacrifice for sins. It's finished. There's no more sacrifice for sin. Now in the New Testament, we do continue to read about sacrifice and it's certainly my testimony now that we sacrifice a lot as we as we go forward in truth in the body of Christ I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to the world so this is what I'm talking about be not conformed to the world that you're sacrificing your life right we sacrifice our life 
because we count everything that we have lost as dung, that we might win, that we might win Christ. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect. Right? Here's that word perfect again, and perfect will of God. Right? So in Romans 12, we're most certainly reading that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, right? It's not a sacrifice for sin. We read that in Hebrews. The Lord Jesus Christ was the final sin offering, but we're absolutely reading. We're reading here that there's still sacrifice. The body of Christ still sacrifice. And we get it again in 1 Peter 2 in verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, right, are built up a spiritual house. Now this is exactly what I'm being led to think we're reading in those scriptures I'm sharing in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 30, in Nehemiah 1, in Jeremiah 7, in Isaiah 56, all of these scriptures that I've been sharing, I'm being led to think that we are we are a spiritual house and we are all a stone that makes up that spiritual house, that spiritual house, the body of Christ, the house of the Lord that we're reading right through the Old Testament, but it's been given. It's now been given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And each one, each one of us is a stone that makes up that house, just like in the Old Testament. Every parcel of land was a stone that made up that, made up that house. But in the Old Testament, they rejected the chief cornerstone. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm being led to think. First Peter two just allows me to put it down absolutely perfect. What the scriptures are leading me to think. But in any case, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, a holy priesthood, right, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by. Jesus Christ. So the body of Christ are offering up spiritual sacrifices. Now this potentially ties in perfectly to what we're reading here in Romans 12. That you look, that it's a spiritual sacrifice because we're no longer conformed to the world because we're now walking in. We're now walking in the spirit. So we're presenting our bodies a living sacrifice as we offer up, as we offer up spiritual sacrifices. Maybe. And again, we get it in Philippians 4, and Paul says, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of, wow, we, the things which were sent from you, an odour of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, right? A sacrifice well pleasing. To God. So Romans 12, the commands to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And that's for me seems to be tied in with walking against the course of the world because we're now walking in the spirit, which for me is what Peter is talking about. We offer up spiritual sacrifices because they're acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're now we're not now we're now not conformed to the world. So potentially I'm seeing Romans 12 here. The sacrifice, our reasonable service, is not being conformed to the world because we are we are offering up spiritual sacrifices because we now walk in the spirit, perhaps. And then in Philippians, we're reading that for me potentially they roll up here. They roll up here that, that those sacrifices, they're well pleasing to God. In fact, they're a they're a sweet smelling savour to the Lord. So then we come back into Isaiah 56, and for me it potentially ties in. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. Those sacrifices being what Paul is talking about and what Peter's talking about, the spiritual sacrifices. That Paul also is pertaining. Well, Paul also is is referring to here in Romans twelve, not being conformed to the world. It's it's hard. It gets difficult, right? And 
a living sacrifice, perhaps. So back in Isaiah 56, as I say, I'm being led to think that this is talking about the church. This is talking about the body of Christ, the everlasting covenant. So sacrifices might not be pertaining to, it might not be pertaining to sin offerings. For me, in the New Testament, for me, as I go on and on, that's what this is pertaining to. The Lord's going to accept our spiritual sacrifices now that we're in the body of Christ. But we also get burnt offerings, right? Now, this is most interesting indeed. Burnt offerings is Hebrew word H5930. We see it 289 times, and it's translated out pretty much all those times as burnt offering or burnt sacrifice. But we also get a scent and go up, right? This is where it gets very interesting indeed. And the outline of biblical usage gives us whole burnt offering, a scent, right? Stairway steps so this just reminds me straight away this this reminds me straight away of of a of a star course the highway the stars fought in their courses against Sarah and jacob's ladder right and this is pertaining this is pertaining to to burnt offerings and the lord is going to accept the lord's going to accept their burnt offerings and their and their sacrifices right so the strong's definition a step or stairs as ascending, usually a, I'm not going to say that word because I'll upset the little hats, as going up in smoke, ascent, burnt offering, sacrifice, go up too. So it's intertwining the two, isn't it? To me, it's like that's what this word means, is that it means a burnt offering and to, and to ascend and to go up, go up, to go up ladders, to... To ascend, to, to, to go up a stairway, right? So we have a look at the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, and it, it, in a, it in a, intertwines it as well. We get whole burnt offering, that which goes up to heaven, others on the altar. So it's a sweet smelling savour potentially that goes up to the Lord, to heaven. A sweet smelling savour. Maybe, but, but here it's absolutely pertaining to both. A whole burnt offering, that which goes up to heaven. And we can see that in the outline of biblical usage and in the Strong's, it's absolutely, it's just intertwining the two meanings. Like they mean the same thing. That's, that's the impression that I'm getting. The whole burnt offering, beast or fowl, is entirely consumed. It goes up in the flame of the altar of God, expressing the ascent of the soul in worship. Now, isn't that fascinating? The ascent of the soul in worship. The ascent of the soul. So the, so the soul is ascending. It's going up. It's going up in the flame of the altar to God. And it's expressing the ascent of the soul in worship and ascending soul due to a burnt offering. I think we may very well have a Salah moment going on here. All of the victim is laid on the altar except the hide and such parts as could not be washed clean. Now the Chaldee lexicon it, it intertwines the two as well. What is laid on the altar, what is offered on the altar, see the root. S specifically, a burnt offering, a sacrifice of which the whole was burned. Genesis 22, so that would be pertaining to Isaac and Abraham. Leviticus 1.4, but then we get number two. An ascent and steps, and it gives us Ezekiel 40, which pertains to this very mysterious vision that Ezekiel saw where he sees, he sees the sacrifice. He sees the sacrifice. So that's always led me to think that it doesn't pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ because it's got a sacrifice there and it's got an altar. But it's pertaining to an ascent and steps. And this absolutely ties in to these other, other translations that we're getting here. So we see it, and it's pertaining to burnt offerings, right? Just burnt offerings of animals that we, well, I've always thought this word means. It's just pertaining to burnt offerings of animals, right? 
But this is what I say. We come into these, we come into these other meanings or other translations, and we see a scent, and we get First Kings ten five. And this for me is is huge because this is talking about this is talking about Solomon and his ascent, his ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord. And there were six steps to the throne and Second Chronicles nine, where he's he's got algum trees from from the king of Tyre, and with those algum trees he made terraces, celestial star courses, to go up to the house of the Lord, and there were six steps to the throne, right? So this is one of those moments, absolutely, where I could potentially just get sidetracked here. This is very interesting indeed. And then we get go up, and this absolutely pertains to this vision that Ezekiel saw. And there were seven steps to go up to it, and the arches thereof were before them. And it had, had palm trees. So I, I start to wonder now, we come back into Isaiah 56, and I really start to wonder now because we're reading that their sacrifices shall be accepted. So this could very well pertain to the scriptures that I just shared, that we in the body of Christ, we offer sacrifices every day that are acceptable to God. But their burnt offerings also shall be accepted. Burnt offerings, which is pertaining, which is pertaining to ascension. <laughs> Ascension, right? Because remembering in the Brown Driver Briggs, we're getting that the whole burnt offering is entirely consumed and goes up in the flame of the altar to God, expressing the ascent of the soul in worship. So this for me is connecting the burnt offering to the ascension of the soul. And remembering also that it also pertains to Solomon and his ascent that he went up to the house of the Lord. He's ascent, right? He's ascent up to the house of the Lord. And in Isaiah 56, they, we're going to come. The Lord's going to bring them, the body of Christ, to his holy mountain, the Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, into an innumerable company of angels, and their burnt offerings shall be accepted. So they're ascent. It's pertaining to ascent. And their sacrifices shall be accepted, right? Their ascent. So this just reminds me now of John 10, where the Lord Jesus Christ declares in verse 9 that he is the door. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief, right? Is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And in verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the door to what? He's the door to the house of the Lord, right? So I'm being led to think that this is pertaining, this is absolutely, it's pertaining to, 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 to ascension. So back in Isaiah 56, we're reading that the church, the church will, uh, it's, it's ascension, right? The, the, the burnt offerings, it's pertaining, it's pertaining to a, it's pertaining to ascension. But in verse 7 we read, for my house shall be called a house of prayer, for all people. So in John 10, the Lord Jesus Christ is declaring that he is the door and all that came before him are thieves, right? They're thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So anyone who enters in not by the door, I'm being led to think to the house of the Lord. So this is, I'm a fever picture. This is pertaining to ascension. So anybody that enters in to the house of the Lord, not by the Lord Jesus Christ, rejecting the chief cornerstone, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, remembering in Isaiah 56, we read, Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house, right? In my house of prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ being the door. The door 
to that house and he will accept their burnt offerings, which is pertaining, which is pertaining to ascension. So back in Mark 11, we're reading that the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes in and he overthrows the tables of the money changers, right? And he casts them out. I've been saying here for months and months that this is led me to think that he's casting out celestial bodies out of the temple, out of the house of the Lord. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations, the church, the house of prayer? And back in Isaiah 56, that's the prophecy. I will bring them to my holy mountain, Mount Zion, the house of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ being the door to the house of the Lord, but they rejected the chief cornerstone and make them joyful. In my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, the Lord Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. But in Mark 11, we are reading that they've made it a den of what? They've made it a den of thieves, right? So, back in John 10, we're reading that anybody that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. I'm being led to think the house of the Lord, they are a thief, right? They're a thief and they're a robber because they're not entering in by the door. Back in Mark 11, they're not entering through the door, right? Because he's, he's casting them out, the, the untimely figs from the, from the dried up fig tree. So th th this for me is all, it's pertaining to ascension. That's what this is starting to look like to me. And he casts them out. He's not accepting. He's not accepting their burnt offerings. Perhaps. Is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations, the house of prayer, the church. That's what we're getting in Isaiah 56. That's the prophecy. But instead, they've made it a den of thieves because they're not going through the door. They're going through the, thou shall not steal, right? We get that in Exodus. But then we come back into Jeremiah 7. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, right? And the and the door. The door is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm absolutely being led to think that this is this is the house of the Lord. This is the this is the fury of the Lord. This is the fury of the Lord overthrowing the tables, and I will cast you out with a mighty tempest, even as I did. Your whole the, with your brethren the whole the whole seed of Ephraim right, and their celestial bodies they're being cast down to it just all connects, I just keep coming back to it it's just all for me it's it's abs I'm just a fever pitch this is pertaining this is pertaining to to ascension, and he taught is it not written my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer but ye have made it a den of thieves thieves right and that's what exactly exactly what we get in Jeremiah 7, will you steal, right? Steal, steal, there I got it, steal, steal. Is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations, the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves, all nations, the house of prayer, the church, because they're all going in by the door into the house of the Lord. But these are all thieves because they're going up some other way. They're not going through the door. So the scribes and the chief priests, they heard it. They wanted to destroy him. And then we're getting the fig tree casting off her, her untimely figs as we read in Revelation 6.13. And then in Jeremiah, this is the prophecy. This is, this is the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ overthrowing the tables. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers? Right? in your eyes because they're not they're not going through the door they're entering in to the house of the lord some other way they're a thief and a robber and i'm being absolutely led to think that this is pertaining to ascension so they're ascending to the house of the lord some other way but the door up and to mount zion the heavenly jerusalem which is what we're reading here in Isaiah 56. So now when I read their burnt offering and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, my, my, my is always in those scriptures. I'm being led to think that there is far, 
far more to consider. On the floor, the people dance around, moving close together. There's the girl I once knew Who broke me into So won't you please play a song A sentimental song For my sentimental friend over there We've been so long apart Make it go right to the heart Of my sentimental friend over there Bring the tears Teardrops would fall and she'd hold me and tell me she'd be forever with me. Sentimental friend over there Oh, won't you please play 